us manish gupta sir founder and cio uh, solidarity investment managers sir is an mba from uh, reputed institute i am ahmedabad uh, to build a business uh, which delivers uh, profits uh, with purpose through solidarity he is attempting to turn aspirations to reality so prior to founding uh, solidarity he had worked for over 7 years with a boston consulting group and for over 8 years with late uh, rakesh junjunwala sir and in his free time he enjoys traveling reading meditation and looking at the world through his daughter's perspective so a very warm welcome sir anything which i missed on your introduction i would request you to uh, kindly add to that uh, over to no, you sir no, no. no uh, thanks prince uh, no this was very generous uh, thanks for the very warm introduction let's get the show on the road so sir like uh, when we start uh, investment journeys so initially we are clueless where to start what to read how to behave so uh, if i were to ask you about your journey how it had been for you how you progressed in your journey on the learning curve around these points okay so um when i joined uh, mr junjunwala i used to primarily work with him in uh, the private equity part of his uh, business so uh, private equity is investing in uh, companies that are not listed and uh, my job used to be to work with those companies and see if we can help those companies grow on strategy on operational metrics uh, on governance if they can improve the quality of their reporting so uh, that was very useful because it gave me a, a good sense of uh, what is a good business right uh, you know uh, uh, i think uh, it, it's buffett or munger who said they are good businesses they are great businesses and they are gruesome businesses so private equity gives you a very good sense because you know you're really working in the engine room uh, with the promoter in some sense so uh, that was the uh, first part of the learning and then i realized that i didn't want to make a career in private equity uh, and uh, the skills that one learns in private equity are pretty much extendable to the listed space you know you analyze companies exactly the same way the difference is on the listed space there is a lot more behavior at play so uh, you know and that's how you know solidarity was born as far as you know the the journey goes on the investment process i mean it's actually a never ending journey you know what investing is fascinating is because you know you can become a, a better version of yourself almost every day and the process is act reflect act reflect rather it's read act reflect you know and the the, the loop keeps going on so uh, i guess you know what i'd encourage uh, you and your and your listeners to do is look at look at it in two or three ways right Uh, so one of my favorite quotes is that in life it's uh, not really about playing the game but having clarity on what game you are playing so there is the there is the so called technical aspects of consulting right which is going through annual reports balance sheets uh, you know trying to gauge whether somebody is a good promoter but you know there are many other questions which uh, i think are quite ambiguous so in investing uh, what is long term you know when someone says you're a long term investor what is long term for the government of india if you hold a stock for one year it's supposed to be long term but if you look at uh, mr junjunwala you know he bought titan in 2004 and you know he's barely sold any stock uh, right over uh, over two decades roughly so what exactly does long term mean to you right and uh, i guess people should also reflect on uh, what is your own personal context are you trying to make money very very quickly uh, do you have more of a trading uh, do you have more of a trading mentality uh, what is your tolerance to drawdowns uh, you know what is your tolerance to volatility what is your tolerance to uh, poor corporate governance so i'm saying you know there no there's no one right answer over here so the journey has progressed not only reading a lot of technical stuff but you know also trying to understand who you are as a person what investing approach works for you um and you know designing a process or an approach that you can stick with for long periods of time 
So I don't know whether this is a bit of a philosophical rant, but uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm happy to expand if anything is not clear here. Uh, right, sir. So taking the talk forward, sir, we normally what we do is we look for answers rather than focusing on asking the right questions. So, so uh, mm. what do you think? Like, what uh, is it the right approach, or should we be like more focusing on uh, looking for the right questions rather than focusing on the answers? So, I mean, can you give me an example? just so that uh, you know it doesn't become very philosophical can you give me a, a, a can you give me a practical example of what you mean by this so as in sir like when we have any kind of confusion or we are looking for confirmation from other people rather than like uh, uh, improving our own process in the sense like we should ask questions to ourselves so as to improve uh, on regular basis and improve our processes okay great so you know uh, i would i would encourage all of you to read almost everything that morgan housel writes right and again there is a great line from him he says a lot of disagreements between people often just boil down to time horizons in which they are looking at a company right so again when you say should i ask uh, somebody for the answer or should i focus on the question you know the answer could be very very different for somebody who uh, is playing a different game so so let me give an example right let's say there is somebody who's wired in a particular way where they have very very limited tolerance to drawdowns right so you know if you want to just you, you need to follow a process that works for you otherwise you know you will just uh, come in and out of the market at the wrong time but if a person cannot uh, you know uh, take drawdowns there is no uh, there is no point Uh, seeking an opinion from somebody who's wired in a way that they can take a lot of pain, right? So the approach has to be first try and understand who you are, and then look for people who are mentors or whom you can go to for questions who are in some sense wired the way you are, right? There is no point if you know you are a very very long term investor. you are seeking answers from somebody who thinks in much shorter time horizons right so the simple point i'm trying to make is the the answer has the, the way forward has to be by asking questions but by asking questions with people who are broadly aligned with the way you are thinking right because otherwise if you if you go to you know you, you don't go to sevak to ask him how to play a defensive shot right you go to dravid you would go to a dravid similarly you would not go to dravid to ask them how to play attacking cricket right so i'm saying figure out the game you are playing look for people to ask questions to who are playing the same uh, game as you are rather than just you know look for a straight answer right sir but sir one major problem which uh, most of us uh, face is how to deal with the abundance because there is so much of information overload and uh, going to social media there is there are so many names <laughs> coming to us on daily basis so how to settle down on that thing so as to in, ignore uh, the most of it and uh, look for something which is uh, relevant uh, to us i mean how how we can progress on this front yeah i think it's, that's a great question so see you have to eliminate right i mean uh, as they say less is more so you know you have to figure out who you think are people who have survived for a long period of time uh, if you follow everyone on social media i think you know uh, it's your you know as they say ki dimag ka bilkul khichdi ho jayega right you have to you have to figure out uh, i i keep coming back to the same point figure out what game you are playing who's playing the same game as you right so if you are a really long term investor then figure out who are the people on social media who are thinking really long term right if the, if you are a guy who is looking for the for the kick of the a quick buck or a quick move then figure out who's the guy on social media who is more of a trader right i think you know anyone who's uh, who's putting up short term results on social media is somebody you should avoid anybody who is not licensed by sebi i think you should be very careful uh so you know i really don't think you need more than three or four people and uh, identify the trick is to identify who those three or four people are for you 
and over time you know uh, learn from what they're doing uh, over time you can uh, drop a few of those pick up some other people as you yourself evolve your own style evolves but you know following everybody on social media and listening to all voices out there is a sure recipe for disaster agree agree to this sir so sir like uh, uh, if if i were to ask like how you react when you listen to disconfirming evidence about uh, say a company specific maybe uh, when when you think like you are positive about the company and somebody uh, says uh, some discomfort uh, disconfirming uh, views about that company so how you take those <laughs> okay that's another great question so um See, firstly, you know we are very ruthless in our in uh, we are very ruthless in our thinking from a perspective that we are really long term investors, right? So what we do is that we carve our portfolio into two buckets. There is a what we call our compounding bucket, which is companies we really want to hold for long periods of time, unless you find a break in your thesis. and the second bucket is which is a very small bucket it's literally no it's never more than 10% of the portfolio right now it's even less than 5 is what we call our special situations right now it is it depends on also what is the nature of the uh, evidence that you are talking about or nature of say some new data that one comes across so um, if somebody is talking about a company we want to own long term where there is a governance issue right that would really concern me right if somebody is talking about a data point where there is a margin drop because there is the war in ukraine or you know supply chains have got messed up you know th- that's the nature of life right i mean uh, you have spring then you have summer you know life is just not one straight linear line it has its ups and downs a company is also a living being so a company will have good days and bad days so you know just a short term blip because uh, what something has happened it would not bother me it has to be something that impacts the long term thesis so it has to be uh, say loss of market share it it has to be something about say if you are betting on a key leader of a company say in a, if you if you put money in a company that is owned by a private equity firm if the ceo of that firm were to leave i think you know that's a big issue because you know you might be betting on a on a particular individual so it really depends on the the data point that one is talking about even if we get discomforting data you know we are long term investors you know we typically will not sell in a panic right i think we would only sell in a panic if we encountered issues around corporate governance which luckily for us you know we have not encountered ever in our 9 year Uh, investment history so the bias would be that what is the nature of the data then you go back to your thesis and see if this is really something that one just needs to take as part of the compounding journey or is it something that really alters your thesis if it alters your thesis you have to act if it is that does not alter the long term thesis you know you just take it in your stride sometimes these things actually give you an opportunity to add to your positions right sir so sir like you you talked about like you believe in building a business uh, which delivers profit with purpose and like when it comes to managing public money so how important do you think skin in the game is for a fund manager and how the process goes when you say profit with purpose you know uh, there is this fund manager in the us uh, vitali katsi nelson right he doesn't even talk about skin in the game he talks about soul in the game right so you know we are managing people's money right so the and you know uh, in our business the quirky thing is that i we cannot guarantee any outcomes right so one of the things that we promise all our clients is because i am the cio i will always have 100% alignment in my positions that we have for our clients right i will never own anything which we don't own for them because i want them to know that while i cannot guarantee you a certain outcome if i don't do well for you even i'm feeling that personal pain right 
Now, I don't want to be moralizing other fund managers about what they should be doing. You know, that's none of my business. Uh, but as far as we are concerned, you know, I completely believe in skin in the game. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I have not compromised on, on over nine years. What others do is none of my business. But if you are putting your money with a fund manager and a fund manager does not have a very large portion of their savings invested in their own fund, you, know, you need to question why. Right, sir. So one question is uh, around, uh, this is from uh, Sajal, sir. So he is asking, how can management be validated in a business where there is huge uh, station period leading to optically poor ROE, ROC, to screen management would be helpful? Uh, Prince, you'll have to repeat that. You know, we got a bad line. Can you repeat that? Hello? You got the question, sir? Yeah, can you repeat that, Prince? I got a bad line from your side, sorry. Okay, okay. So, how can management be validated in a business where there is huge gestation period, which leads to optically poor ROE, ROC, and cash flows initially? So, any pointers to screen management would be helpful around this. Okay, great, great. I think that's a great question. So, uh, see, what we do is, uh, like I said, we have our portfolio broadly around two things. Most of our portfolio is really around compounding. Uh, but even in our compounding bucket, we cut our portfolio broadly into two sub buckets. One is what we call clear leaders. You know, an example of a clear leader would be, say, an HDFC bank or an ICICI bank. And uh, an example of an emerging leader might be, you know, a small in a, or a mid-cap uh, company. So what we do is that when we first, uh, you know, we're all making probabilistic bets, right? Uh, none of us knows the future for certainty. So what we do is we categorize a company into one of four buckets. You know, we call it internally phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. But to use an analogy, think of it as a phase one bucket is somebody who's like a club cricketer. Think of phase two as somebody who's a Ranji cricketer. Phase three, thinks of some, think of somebody who's been selected to play for India. And phase four, think about somebody who's like a Virat Kohli. You know, not only has he played for India, but he's been around for a while and is a complete champion. So what we do is that when you're buying a company, which is, say, a phase one or a phase two company, you know, club cricketer or Ranji cricketer, you know, you know, this is not meant pejoratively. This is just a relative skill set. First thing you would do is that we would never take a very large position in some of these companies, right? So everything is a hypothesis. Everything is a bet. And as you see management scaling up, you know, you would increase the size of the bet. So to give you an example, a phase one, you know, we tend to buy not more than 15 or 20 positions. So a phase one company would never be more than 3% of the portfolio. A phase two company might be four or five. A phase three might be six or six to eight. And a phase four might be, you know, 10 to 12 or something like that. So the way we evaluate management is that we look, we, you know, you, you we stay with them for a while. So you would never take a very big position, like a six or an eight percent position in a company where you've not interacted with the promoter for at least, you know, two years or so. So first is just give it a bit more time because then you see, uh, you've got a lot more data points to understand how the company is doing. You never really understand a company till you've actually lived with this company for a while. You know, I mean, one of the things that I'm always surprised by is how much more we discover about a company after we've invested in it. And then, you know, you are tracking the company over time. So the first one is you just have to give it some more time and don't take such a big position that it makes you lose your patience up front. The second one, and which I have found uh, as a big difference between small and mid-cap promoters, when we think about where to categorize them, is the granularity with uh, how they are thinking. So uh, we have some companies in our portfolio where we see the, the promoters investing based on a lot of big picture thinking. You know, you build the plant and, you know, things will happen and, you know, the demand will come. And there are other people who are able to explain to you in a far more granular manner how they think life is going to unfold for them. 
you know, when they do a capital expansion. So uh, what we have learned is always to back the guy who's thinking in a lot more granular manner. We are always looking for people who are adding to a management team. So I'm not, I'm not in the camp that says one should ba- uh, bet on professional CEOs and you know family uh, ownership is bad. I think you know uh, some families make for great companies to invest in. But you know we all need to evolve with time, right? All of us as individuals need to evolve with time. So the other thing we are looking for is that how is the family evolving? Do you see them adding uh, to management depth or is the family still wired in a way that they can do everything by themselves? So I would say, uh, you know, I find these two metrics very useful other than the categorization and the position sizing, looking at how the family itself is building talent in the company. And second is the granularity with which the promoter is thinking. Right, sir. sir, when it comes to uh, managing public money, the client communication is a very important thing. So, I mean, how easy or how difficult you find uh, so as to communicate with the client in the sense like so as to convey what thought process uh, is there in and how how easy is to like make them understand that? And any challenges well, you you any challenges you face uh, uh, while uh, in this this process? Well, you know, I think the uh, you know we communicate a lot, and you know the reason we communicate a lot is because uh, we write a lot internally. So you know, as the CIO of the firm, I will never review any company unless there is actually a document which is in a format that we use about how we analyze the company. And uh, every analyst uh, at our firm is also evaluated on uh, how well they write, right? And, you know, this is actually, I think asset management, investment management was a business of trust. You know, it was like the, it, it was like the family doctor. And I think, unfortunately, our industry has lost its way. You know, we've become more of a marketing led industry where somebody will show the performance of a fund manager in you know, uh, I've also seen somebody saying in the last one month, three months, this person has done this. So I think the industry has lost its way. And the way we are building our franchise is very clear that we don't want to grow very fast, but we want to work with our clients who actually think long term. And the only way, therefore, to attract those clients uh, is to uh, be able for them uh, to trust you. And the only way somebody will trust you is if they understand what you're doing. And hence, we tend to communicate a lot. I mean, we write quarterly letters, we write blogs. Um, You know, we offer a a callback within 72 hours to any client who wants to talk to us. And if we also detect that somebody is not actually thinking really long term, we encourage them to talk to us and understand our process. And, you know, if somebody is still not wired long term, we would actively actually encourage them to take their money back. You know, this is a stressful business, right? I mean, you know, we don't want to take AUM with people who are playing a different game than what we are. So I would imagine that actually this is the toughest part of the investment business because uh, it takes a lot of time to do it properly. And uh, But, you know, this is the only way that uh, I believe that you can attract the right kind of clients and get them to stay with you. If we want to think long term, we have to communicate to clients that we are thinking long term. And hopefully, uh, you will then attract the ones that uh, you deserve. And uh, it'll be it'll have uh, a sticky uh, relationship. So you know, we've been now working, uh, we've been managing money for about nine years, we work with about over 200 families. In nine years, I think we have had less than 10 families who have uh, actually exited solidarity. So we have a lot of sticky business because we communicate a lot on the kind of families we want and what we are doing. So if any of you is looking to build your own investment firm, I cannot uh, encourage you more to write, to communicate. Uh, You have to communicate to your clients, not with social media. You know, uh, it's okay if you put up your stuff on social media, but what you need, you know, you just need five, 10 really sticky clients who believe in you and understand what you're doing. And your virtuous cycle will, you know, kind of start spinning.
right sir and in the perspective section on your website where your blogs and quarterly letters are available they are really helpful and great read i must say so coming to so like although nothing against any fund manager but we have seen like just like uh, retail investors small retail investors we have seen like even some uh, people who are managing public money were like investing in fomo so in <clears throat> valuation is sir one aspect which is very crucial right so you you guys also believe in secular compounding as a re- reasonable price and i mean believe in giving a fair valuation uh, to a company where growth is visible so so what's your view around this in the sense like uh, is there uh, i mean some pointers around your valuation framework you know uh, so you know the standard model everyone will use in valuation is actually a discounted cash flow right but see the challenge with with discounted cash flow is that it requires you to make a lot of assumptions right so you're making assumptions on uh, cost of capital right there is no one cost of capital you know i've heard i've seen people uh, put using uh, 10% as cost of equity in india i've seen people using 14 and a half percent so you know there is no one number second thing is the model is very very sensitive to both short term growth rates and to terminal value right so we use dcf uh, but you know uh, essentially we use dcf to kind of draw broad valuation bands right so for example you know we are very optimistic about manufacturing out of india right now so if we see a manufacturing business which is say about 18 to 20% Uh, return on capital employed uh, which could be say a 20% roe business which we think can grow at 15% for really long periods of time you know and it's a business that we think has got a reasonable moat you know in our internal framework while we would want to pay not more than 20 times trailing earnings if i really like the promoter i might go up to 25 times now uh so essentially what you're doing is that you're doing a dcf but you know you're not trying to pin down a very precise number you're coming up with a broad range you know for a company we really like we might go up to 35 times and you know there is one company in our portfolio where uh, you know uh, we are willing to go even higher but you know those are really really very rare kind of assumptions very broadly you know i think if we go i start getting a bit uncomfortable paying more than 25 to 30 times earnings and you know beyond 40 times is a real red line right because the world is uncertain there is so much of disruption that's happening now there are other people who might be even more conservative than we are uh, there are people who might be more aggressive than we are you know everyone's got their own logic and their own thought process but this is the broad framework that we use um so you know it's really a function of growth roe uh, what you believe is the longevity of growth how much you like the management what's the width of the moat and then you make judgment calls within a broad range right so so uh, for our attendees uh, just in case uh, if you have any questions so please feel free to send in a speaker request but ensure that there would not be any stock specific questions from you so coming to next question so so any view on the beaten down financial services sector like insurance and amcs uh, which has taken the incremental hit due to the regulatory changes in one last year so what what's broadly i mean not talking about the companies specific but again broadly as a sector uh, what what's your view around that okay so you know uh, one of the frameworks again that we use or a mental model that i like to use when i when i invest is i look for win 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 businesses right win for the consumer win for the government or the regulator and a win for the company right i don't think amcs including solidarity we are win 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 businesses right and the problem with that is the um, the fact that you charge people for providing your services but there is no guarantee that you will end up with a good outcome right now as you can also see sebi is always coming down on the mutual fund industry now even on the pms industry sebi is increasing regulation 
so you know this is not an industry which you know i think is in favor with regulators right now so i am aghast at how uh, you know if you look at the data on uh, large cap mutual funds now this data is a bit dated but the last i think i looked at it was 6 or 9 months ago but you know over 95% of large cap mutual funds have underperformed the index right so uh, you know it it really begs the question of why should this industry trade at such high multiples when the service you are providing is not showing a tangible value to the customer right so you know we see asset management industry as one with not very strong moats or with eroding moats right so we are not invested in asset management uh moving on to healthcare health insurance uh, i think health is a is a health insurance is a lovely business so it's, it's a great example of a win 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 business uh, a consumer needs health insurance uh you know the regulator allows um companies to reprice if their claim ratios are going out of whack the regulator wants the industry to grow and do well and i think the economics of the industry is such that you know uh, you can make a 16 to 17% accounting roe but if you look at it on a cash flow basis or on uh, ifrs basis you know the roe will be at least 2 3 percentage points higher so you know we own we have a big position in health insurance we really like the sector we also are very very optimistic about life insurance it's not done well for us uh, over the last 2 or 3 years but uh, you know uh, i think uh, the industry is uh, the, the accounting in life insurance is very hard to understand and uh, because you know in life insurance you pay much higher commissions in the first year so the faster you grow uh, or the better you perform in the year your profits will be weaker so you know pe ratios and all just don't work and concepts like embedded value new business margin these are very very complicated and uh the industry is essentially built on uh, a lot of assumptions now uh, a lot of my fund manager friends tell me that this is the reason why they stay away because it's just too complicated and you don't get a real feel for what the profit after tax is and i have a lot of sympathy for their opinion but you know we think it's a very very profitable industry so as an example and in the full interest of disclosure we own spi life insurance but you know spi life has not raised equity if my memory serves me right from 2006 now if they have not raised equity since 2006 and when i last did the numbers they have compounded book value at over 17% over a decade so if you are in financial services if uh, you are if your roe is higher than your growth you don't need to raise equity so i think this is a good example of an industry which again needs uh, which i think is a great it's a win win product i think uh, protection is a fantastic product everybody should own it annuities is a very good product i think ulips have some advantages over a mutual fund the advantage a ulip has over a mutual fund is you you can change your allocation between equity and debt without triggering any tax incidents so you know uh, th- this is not worked well for us but it's still a fairly large position uh, so we are optimistic on life insurance so if i summarize asset management as of now we don't own any company we may own in the future uh, life insurance we are invested and health insurance we are invested right sir so we got two speakers avinash ji you can go first yeah i think uh, manish ji first of all the, you know your view point on the markets and on your observation on how you you know have a framework is really very good i think uh, prince uh, thank you very much for inviting manish ji uh, i have two questions one is as far as manufacturing companies go you know what is the kind of importance you give for cash flow you mentioned that you like manufacturing as a theme and secondly uh, you know for most of the new fintech companies you know what kind of valuation metrics do you think uh, is the best you know to actually understand their future potential uh thanks avinash um see any company that is growing very very quickly right i think you know i see i see a lot of uh, investment literature where people will focus on return on capital people will focus on return on equity people will focus on cash from operations i think these are very very 
important metrics. But as I started, uh, you know, uh, the, the first thing I had started off in Prince, uh, with Prince, I think it's very important to, again, understand the context in which a company is. If you are growing at 30 to 40 percent, you cannot generate any free cash because you are reinvesting all your profits, both in working capital and in manufacturing. The moment your growth slows down from 35 to 20 and over time to 15, you will be spinning out cash like an oil well, right? So for a company that is growing very, very fast, as long as I believe they're taking the right strategic decisions, I am not fussed at all if they are not generating any free cash. I am not even worried if the operating cash flow is very, very poor. Why is that? When you are growing very quickly, and like where India is in a huge land grab moment right now because of you know what's happening with China and de-risking, so companies have this real opportunity to you know tie up decadal long relationships. If I was the CEO of a company, what I would not want to do is lose a client because uh, you know I have not been able to deliver on time. So I will be keeping extra inventory, right? Because I'm now expanding my product range, I will not be very efficient in manufacturing because my runs will not be very long. You know, I will have a lot of changeovers. As a result of which, the productivity of my plant will reduce and my WIP inventory will go up, right? So what is important is to understand the context under which a company is. So if a company is growing very, very quickly, if you believe strategically they're doing the right thing, then I think for a short period of time, it's okay to ignore the fact that the company might not be generating cash, right? So that's the answer to the first question. Your answer to the sec my answer to your second question on, uh, you know, new age companies, you know, uh, I understand. So when we look at a company, as I just explained, I tend to look for win, win, win outcomes. So, uh, you know, a lot of these companies, I think they they have a value proposition, which is good for the consumer. I don't understand what is their steady state economics and when they will make money. I will. I am not interested in taking a venture capital bet in the public markets. I'm happy to wait till these companies uh, come up with an economic model that I can understand. Uh, you know, because every every for us every investment is an investment thesis with a probability. So I understand the thesis, but I don't understand what's the probability of their economics and the time horizon in which those economics will be delivered. So, you know, we are very happy uh, not participating. I'm very comfortable with the notion that some of these companies might do well and we'll miss out. But that's okay. You know, I, I don't want, I want, if I'm investing in a company, I want to have the confidence that I can buy more if a stock is down 15, 20%. But if I don't understand what the economics of a company is and the stock is down 15, 20%, I will never have the confidence to add. So I'm better off not participating at all. I'm not a venture capitalist. I'm an investor in the public markets. So I'm riding a very different risk and reward curve. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think, thank you very much, Manish Thanks, uh, Avinash Ji. So, Vardy, you can unmute and ask a question, then we go to Virat, sir. Uh, good evening, Manish ji. Hello. Hi, good evening. Your voice is good. not very clear. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, but there's... Uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm a long-term technical investor. Just go on technical and management pedigree. Don't look at ROC, ROE, or any number. My problem is now scalability. As I only average in profit, that is pyramiding. My problem is now position sizing. Can you elaborate on position sizing? Uh, you know, sir, I really don't understand uh, what you do because, uh, you know, I'm more of a fundamental bottom-up investor. Right. So, uh, you know, I explained earlier in the call how we think about position sizing for fundamental companies, uh, I'm mm. no, I will not be competent to answer your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So, Virat, sir. Hi, hi, Manish. Uh, super talk, yeah. Um, Manish, I had a question in terms of because you're doing this for such a long time, and and obviously you are a far more longer term investor. At least you aspire to be far more longer term than most of the other people. 
but if the time frame of your eventual investor is very different and than yours it it leads to a lot of fallout between you and your clients and it messes up with your process or philosophy or it messes up with your mind so how do you kind of tackle that and not let that affect you and your team in your investment judgment so viraj firstly uh, i must say that i read almost everything you publish so i really uh, i really like uh, how you write what you write so if you have a mailing list and you can add me on it i'll really appreciate oh, it oh absolutely but I, i i read everything you write okay so you know viraj i think uh, for you and for me i think this is a very very important question right i gave a talk at a ypo in delhi uh, just last week on thursday okay and the uh, people who invited me to talk they really they started off by saying that uh, in fact one of the people who invited me to talk he started of the talk saying the first thing my business school professor in my investment class told me put all your money in the vanguard etf and don't ask me for stock tips right so i told them i said for 90% of people an exchange traded fund is actually the right way to invest as a long term investor right and the answer is it's very clear why because investing requires uh, two things right it requires the analytics and it requires the behavior right everyone is smart everyone has access to everyone's portfolio so what really differentiates one investor from the other one is behavior patience ability to take the drawdown now the challenge in our profession as you very rightly said is that i think very few people actually understand themselves and so people want long to be long term investors but without the downside without the volatility and there is a therefore an inherent contradiction right so i i can't claim that i have discovered the answer there but the first slide of our pitch deck when we talk to people is it starts with really the statement of here are the five things that you should know and we tell people that unless you are willing to give us 5 years we are the wrong people for you we will have a low churn portfolio we will not chase momentum uh, our return indic- we tell people that you know we are not hunting down multi baggers our goal is to deliver 3% alpha to you post our fees so if you know we tell people that if long term the index is done about 11 if i can do anything over 15 for you long term i think i would have done a good job so we are trying very hard up front to set expectations and you know uh, the thing that i'm constantly surprised by is that the very successful people that i work with uh, the very successful business families you know they some of the very successful business families actually tell me that manish are you over committing if you think you can do 15 long term and some of the novo rich families i come across will tell me that unless you can do over 20% you know why are we even spending time with you right so what i have discovered is that i think if you can compound money at anything between 15 to 18 for long periods of time it's a remarkable return and i think we are more in the lower end of that range now rather than the higher end because monetary policy globally is going to be a headwind right we've had two decades of very easy monetary policy and all of that is going to reverse or it's, it's already started reversing so if a long only manager can do about 15% without giving you a lot of heebie jeebies i think you know that's a very good return so uh, viraj you know long answer but if i have to summarize it you have to focus on uh, communicating stuff up front i think you've got to be comfortable with a lower pace of growth uh not try and grow too fast uh and the third thing that we do is that we are very very selective in use of distribution so i will not work with uh most distributors because i want to make sure that people who are coming onto our platform are people who are aligned with the way we are thinking if you use distribution or if you use extensive distribution without screening out who you are using you lower the probability of that because you don't know what the distributor has communicated to the end client thank you so much it's it, it's an absolutely super answer yeah um second question if i'm allowed to ask prince uh is please is it sir okay? what so so you know again there is a there is a difference and again i am i'm also kind of finding it myself i i don't know the right answer to this 
which is why I'm asking somebody like you who's been in the market much longer than me, is there is a there is a thin line between being patient with your investment and being stupid with your investment. So, like you essentially, let's say, have a thesis around a company, right? And 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 that thesis is taking more and more time to play out. And you say, you know what? I'm okay. I mean, some of the companies play out later, but they kind of return extravagantly well later. So it just makes up for the lost time. But let's say, how do you differentiate between that? I mean, between being like just too early and between just being wrong? Because like if you're wrong and you come to know of it after five years, I mean, it is better to come to know of it after two years, right? So which is that line after which you say, you know what, probably I'm just wrong. Yeah. So, you know, Viraj, this is a great question. I think, you know, these are one of those, you know, I, I would say th- this would be one of those five questions, which one would say are the holy grail of long-term investing, right? And what we do is, uh, you know, we are also in pursuit of this holy grail. So there are a couple of things that we do. The first one is that we tell ourselves that unless we are horribly wrong, right, where, you know, it's so obvious that, you know, we have gone wrong, uh, we will give an investment at least three years, you know, give it the analogy of a guy you've inducted into a test squad, right? You tell the guy, you know, let the guy play three test matches, right? So the first thing is we will give the guy at least... um, uh, you know, three years. The second thing that we do is we track operating v- metrics very, very carefully, right? So, uh, you know, the revenue and the profit may not come because like, so there's a company in our portfolio that for the last couple of years has just had one or the other, you know, bad macro uh, events impacting them. So first it was uh, the auto cycle in India, Uh, Then it was the demonetization. Then it was the uh, Ukraine war. Then it was the semiconductor shortage, right? So, you know, profit numbers are just not coming. But when we look at the company, we see significant progression in operating metrics, whether it is market share gain, whether it is new customer wins, whether it is develop of new product lines. So, you know, what we tell ourselves is this is a bit like a coiled spring. When it releases, the earnings is going to come back exponentially. So you track operating metrics. And the last thing is, you know, you got to manage position sizing. If a position is not letting you sleep well because it's not doing something, you know, it's not a very pleasant feeling to just get up every morning and question yourself, yeah, am I doing this right? I have, you know, bring the position down to a certain size where you say, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm, wrong, I will not look like a complete idiot. And if I'm right, I will not look like a complete genius. So let me bring the position down to a level where I can tolerate a little bit more pain. So these are three things that we are doing, Viraj. And again, I think it's a great question. It's the holy grail. If you have some ideas on how you do this, I would love to learn from you. I mean, I'll tell you what our process is. And, and again, we violate our own process a few times because um, you tend to get a little attached to the companies. I mean, you tend to get attached. You, I mean, it's like, it's like love affair, right? You tend to get attached to things that you have worked on and you have put in a lot of effort and, and you feel, you know, now it's just going to happen. Next quarter, it's going to happen. But but we put a time frame. I'll, at least what we have done is, let's say there is a thesis and a thesis has, let's say, three legs to that thesis to play out. And we give companies six quarters. If two of the, let's say, legwork in, or let's say one of the legwork or one and a half legwork is playing out out of three legwork in those six quarters, we'll let it run another six quarters and see if all the three legs work. I mean, generally, I mean, there are two or three legs to every thesis in in a stock that we buy, right? But if only one leg is working and two are not working after six quarters, we said, chuck it. We were just wrong. I didn't have that kind of thought process probably 10 years back. But as and when you start managing more public money, you kind of, 
रीच अ पॉइंट वेर लाइक पांच साल बाद अगर स्टॉक डबल भी हो जाएगा उसके बाद तो आई मीन इट डजेंट रियली हेल्प राइट आई एम जस्ट टू अर्ली so i give company six quarters for probably playing out at least half my thesis and if it does i'll stick around for another couple of years but if it doesn't even there is not an iota of change in in how things are happening i'll i'll probably just move on yeah yeah so that's the very similar to the operating metrics that we track right so i don't fuss about the financials but i fuss about the operating metrics yeah but there are a lot of i mean just to put into perspective i don't only mean operating metrics right because in a lot of companies at least that we own there is not too much of operating data that we even get right but i mean i let me let me just give you an example for, for example we we invested in a jewelry company and uh, based in south india and it's a very small tiny company and like jewelry is a very bad sector to invest in to begin with to be honest so you have all of your doubts ki yaar jewelry mein kya hoega kya nahi hoega you be the whole thesis was that a there will be store expansion and square footage expansion there will be a uh, margin expansion because he's at 2% margin and on an average people do 3 to 4% fat margin i'm talking about is at 1 and a half percent and there will be some operating leverage and three as more and more people or dwellers come into the fold the organized players will gain market share and he's honest and the cheapest one so i mean actually there is no operating metrics in this in my mind right but if none of these and and the stock price actually didn't go any like i bought this in 2017 2020 it was the same stock price so at some point you start questioning ki chal kya raha hai right but at least inherently his margins were improving his square footage was improving if both of these things would not have played out i would have sold out but these two were playing out so i thought ki chalo ruk the and then obviously it became mm. like a four five bagger and we still we hold it but i'm just saying like the thesis wise at least it has to play out a little bit otherwise how do you gain any confidence yeah now hear you thank you so much manish for your time yeah thank you so much yeah yeah sure sure guys thanks uh, viraj so kaushik you can unmute and keep your question to manish sir I think some issue on it. Uh, okay, he's on I, uh, am I audible, okay. Prince? Yeah, go uh, ahead, please. Hi, sir. Uh, I, uh, thanks for coming on the space. So, I just wanted to understand what exactly the key trigger you look at for in a company or like any specific on the sector. Is it on a top down or is it on a bottom down? Because I I have joined late. Uh, if I have missed, I'm sorry for that. So. Uh... See, when you say a key trigger, I mean, uh, I don't know how to answer. Okay, so let me give you an example on manufacturing uh, about how we are thinking about it right now. So when we meet companies, right? Today I'm hearing some version of this story that as a company I have built some skills over the last decade. I managed to supply uh, our some of our clients or some people whom we were targeting products during covid and during the lockdown where they were finding it hard to get supplies the world wants to de-risk now they are looking at me far more seriously right so there is this narrative there is this story right now what that tells me is again an example of a company that you know uh, we are buying right now uh, where the company is got less than 1% global market share of its product category this is the story the guy has raised capital he is doing a lot of expansion and he is confident that he could fill up his whole plant in the next 2 years because he's just 1% market share and therefore he's got the product he's got the customer he just has to execute right now this is a good example of a trigger that something is changed in the environment which gives you a stimulus something is changed for the company internally as well because they've raised capital so they have the capital to expand capacity but what none of us knows even the promoter does not know and this is a complete leap of faith is what could be the timeline in which the plant would get filled up you know there could be delays in the plant coming online you don't know what's happening with the war you don't know what's happening uh, with the recession 
you don't know at what pace the customer will transfer product from other suppliers to this person. That has to be a leap of faith, right? So there will never be a precise trigger, right? You know, you have to kind of put uh, two and two together and make some intelligent bet. So for example, in a company like this, you know, you know if the plant gets full up, even if you have paid 30 times earnings, you will make a lot of money. But if the guy cannot fill his plant in three years, you could pay 15 times earnings today and still not make a lot of money, right? So a lot of this is judgment, right? You have to judge uh, the promoter, what he has done in the past, vis-a-vis what he's communicated, what his capacity utilization has been in the past, and size the position in a way which will give you the confidence to be able to play this, to you know have the patience with, with whatever volatility the market throws at you, to be able to live this three-year thesis out. As you get more confidence, you can increase your position, right? So I don't know whether this answers your question, but this is the way we look at it. Uh, sir, this answers my question. Sir, uh, I just have a top up on this question that uh, what happens if there is a manufacturing team that we are liking and everything is going good, but we are getting the same company at a holding discount from another company where it is holding more than like 50-60% of the company. So how do you take it this one? Would you go for the holding company because you are getting the discount or would you go for the main company? Well, okay, so in, in all interests, uh, I have, uh, you know, we are actually uh, uh, invested in a hold core today where we like the underlying. So I would do that, but only if the discount is wide enough to make it uh, worth, worth the while. Uh, but uh, the problem with hold cores is they tend to be very illiquid. And if, unless you like the underlying business, if you really like the underlying business, you want to own the underlying business then I think the Holdco thing is really worthwhile. Uh, there has been a change in laws. Section 80M has got reintroduced where Holdcos, if they pay out all the dividend that they've received from the underlying company, uh, they will not have to pay any tax. So our hypothesis also is that the Holdco discounts vis-a-vis -vis the main companies for a lot of companies will narrow over time because more dividend will be paid out and therefore concerns around capital allocation will be low. But uh, we, this is the way we would participate. If we really like the underlying, we would be happy to participate in the whole. Thanks, Kosh. Thanks, sir. Uh, I got my answer. I'll come back in the night. Thanks, Manish. Thanks. So, Manish, sir, it's already one hour. Like, I just want to ask you how good we are on time to take it forward. Yeah, as, as long as the questions are good. Oh, great, great. great. So, Naveen, uh, you can quickly unmute and uh, ask your question, please. Thanks, Prince. Uh, good evening, Manish. I have a two-part question. Uh, the first one is, how do you think about uh, loading up on a position from the initial tracking size to its max position size? How long do you take? Do you wait for quarters to validate your thesis before you add more, or do you just jump in and then buy the whole lot? So that's the first part. Second part is um, any quantitative filters that you use on a broad level on market cap or ROE or promoter holding uh, on a broad level. Of course, there'll be exceptions to financials, non-financials, et cetera, but on a broad level. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about this earlier. We, we cut our portfolio in four buckets, right? And um, so to, to give a cricketing analogy, we classify companies as uh, in their stage of evolution as, say, club cricketer, Ranji cricketer, playing for India, and, say, Virat Kohli type, right? Played in India, been around, done that for a while. So, uh, essentially, you ask yourself, where would you categorize this company? And somebody who's what is a phase one company for us, like a club cricketer, would never exceed a 3% weight, never. Even if the stock goes down and you really like the company, but if you still think that in their in their stage of evolution, they are still phase one, you would we would typically keep it at three percent. Phase two would typically be five. Phase three would be eight. Phase four could be ten percent. So to give an example, in our portfolio, uh, again uh, a disclosure here. So if we really like a bank which we think is a top tier bank, you know we'd buy ten percent on day one. You know that's not a problem if we thought that the price was right. But if it's like a small or mid-cap company where 
uh, you've not really lived with the promoter for a while. You don't have uh, a long history of interacting with him. Uh, you see some mistakes. There is no predictability of the PNL. But you know, you think there is some opportunity because of what's happening in India right now. Then you would take a three or a five percent position. And the scale up would depend on how comfortable you feel with how the company is evolving. Typically, phase one and phase two companies we would never average down. You know, we should not. In fact, one of the big mistakes we made was that we averaged down on a company that we were very excited about, only to discover later that our thesis was absolutely wrong. So, you know, not only did you invest in the wrong company, but you compounded your error by averaging down. So, phase one and phase two we would never average down. Phase three and phase four we are happy to average down if uh, you know the price is coming down because. we look for compounding and uh you know so if the price is down because of a bad quarter or something there are very good opportunities and uh averaging up uh, so when you would buy more like you said it really depends on whether you think a company is evolving from a phase 1 to a phase 2 company uh you know a phase 1 company typically would be somebody whom you know a customer just gives a good break to you sign up with an mnc customer phase 2 is where you see the guys able to deliver with quality you see the customer scaling up phase 3 is where you would see you know some diversification happening with customers products some more emerging and phase 4 you know it's really a company which is now a consensus trade you know everyone likes the company you just have to be sure you're paying the right price so as you as you see the company evolving and you're honest with yourself on how you look at it you we progress it along our phases and we increase the size of the bet accordingly does this answer your question yeah, this is perfect a lot of good insights thank you manish the second part is on the quantitative filters that you use on a broad level yeah yeah sorry about that so uh, we use two broad filters first is uh, you know we will not invest in a company uh, where the roe is less than 15% and we don't invest in companies where the debt to ebitda is over 3 and the third filter is that we would not invest in any company where the promoter has a track record of shafting the minority shareholder so these three are the uh, two quantitative and the third is the qualitative metric these are our red lines great stuff i have a few other questions but uh, for the sake of time i just want to thank you for spending your time here like you uh i am also a big fan of viraj's writings and his interviews but uh, i would also uh, take this opportunity to thank you for your for generously sharing your newsletters so that's a great thing thank you thank you thank you thanks navin so uh, uh manish sir like china opening up and the com- or less the market was sideways so i um, mean do you see any kind of broad based well forward from here or uh, like that doesn't fit your framework as uh, you think of investments from a comparatively lo- a longer period of so prince i think uh, your voice was not very clear i think you were asking something about uh, what we think about might happen to the market short term is that your question yeah in lines of china opening up and the uh, the commodity prices are softening up so across sectors it might benefit so any any view around that yeah so prince you know we really don't think about that i mean we've never looked at if we see uh, you know we are bottom up we don't look at what's happening to china we don't try and make a forecast of what's happening in the short term in the markets we are intensely uh, bottom up investors so the the question that is important is not china opening up the question that is important to us is uh, so for example uh, but uh, i'll answer an ancillary question one that you've not asked but that has implications for china opening up so for example if china has opened up you would have seen a lot of agrochemical companies taking a real uh, hit on their margins right but the chemical companies we own have not been impacted because they serve the innovators and they are not serving the generic people so our choices reflect moats right we are looking for as i said we are looking for leadership we are looking for compounding so the fact that china is opening up uh, you know for a guy who thinks short term the implication of that will be china is opening up you know this company is not going to do well because of blah 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 reason so i better sell this or i might do something else 
you know, we are not interested in jumping in and out of positions. We want to run very low churn portfolios, right? Ideally, I want to keep our churn less than 20%, only because you want to adjust for risk or if you're wrong or something like that. But ideally, we really want to buy companies where we have intent to hold them for really long periods of time. So China opening up, interest rates moving, you know, none of these things would change how we think. Right, sir. Although in your past interactions, you have talked a lot about it, but any anything you want to take stakes in your last two plus decades of experience? Sorry, Naveen, you'll have to repeat that. Your voice was not clear. Sir, I was asking like uh, uh, the mistakes of the past. So although in your previous interactions you had discussed about them, but anything which you want to discuss on uh, your mistakes and learnings from them? Yeah. So, yeah, great. So, you know, uh, I think in our nine-year career, we've had three or four occasions. I think maybe four occasions where we've lost more than 30% on a stock, right? I think you learn when you lose money. You know, there, there's really no learning when you make money. So, I, you know, if I look at these three or four learnings, uh, the first one is where, uh, you know, uh, I surrendered my own judgment to the opinion of somebody I, res I respected a lot more, even though I understood a lot more about that company, you know. So I won't go into specifics, but you know, that's the learning. You've just got to back your own self. Uh, a, a, a second learning where we made a mistake again was uh, narrative, very excited about prospects of the company and we compromised on the amount of debt that the company had. And a lot of everything that was supposed to come through did not come through. The, the world changed and now suddenly companies done a lot of capex, has a lot of debt and the world has changed, right? So, you know, that, that discipline of not compromising on balance sheet discipline, you know, keeping the debt to EBITDA of three. You know, every time what we have learned is that, you know, if you uh, break that discipline, you know, there is a reasonable probability that a company will survive, uh, will, will actually surprise you and do very well. But, you know, the ones that clean you out, net net, you would be better off just staying disciplined. Now, it's not that, you know, right now we are not breaking that discipline. Uh, but, you know, uh, if a company right now, you know, a lot of Indian manufacturing is in land grab mode, where we think a, a promoter is very, very granular in their thinking, we we get a good feel about the promoter. We might compromise a little bit if it means that, you know, for a period of six months, nine months or 12 months, the debt to EBITDA goes slightly out of whack just because somebody is in CapEx mode. But typically, debt, or, debt to EBITDA of three is a red line for us. I think the third learning, uh, again, we talked about it, was uh, a mistake we made where it was dual mistake. A, we overestimated the width of the moat. I think uh, because of COVID, also the earnings uh, kind of created some confusion on what is the true ROC of the business. It was actually a phase two company. We thought it's a phase three company. So you took a large position because, you know, you felt good about it. And when the stock kept falling, we kept buying more rather than just stopping. And, uh, and you know, the, the investment was also premised on a merger, which was announced. That merger fell through. So, you know, it was a real shit show. Everything just came together. So the real learning there was, A, again, you know, you have to go deeper to understand the width of the moat. Be clear that, you know, it's not one-off events or a favorable tailwind that is driving short-term financials. The second thing is to be very, very careful if you're investing a uh, basis of a corporate announcement. You know, one might be better off waiting for uh, whatever the corporate announcement is to finally happen, finally consummate, and then buy at a higher price rather than, you know, come in early because, you know, things kind of fall between the cracks. So I think, you know, you know, we, we, we will make mistakes, right? I mean, uh, if you don't make uh, enough mistakes in this business, you're not taking uh, prudent risk. But the important thing is just to be honest, keep introspecting on that, have a culture where, you know, junior people in your team are not afraid to speak up if they think you're making a wrong call. And over time, you will see that, you know, you're correcting mistakes faster, you're, you're making uh, fewer ones that are very big, and then you're putting the odds in your favor. I think our business is really about who makes the 
your mistakes that person is going to win so yeah right sir so sir what what do you think could be uh, i mean uh, how can become more disciplined is there any approach which we can uh, or, or obviously it is no i'm sorry navin i can't understand you your line is not very nice um i was asking like how one can become more disciplined as far as their investing process is concerned i think the thing that i would strongly advise is to write uh, stuff down when you write stuff down you know it clears the cobwebs in your own mind it forces you to be honest with your own self uh you know so writing down the thesis sharing the thesis with somebody whom you respect uh you know having a club of people who are actually you know if you're short term oriented you know having a club of people who are essentially playing the game the same way as you right will really help in keeping you honest uh you know this is essentially uh, this game is about uh, minimizing fomo but also recognizing inflection points right so uh, if you write stuff down and people have got through your thesis and you know there is no uh, big uh, big assumptions there that are incorrect and you are paying a broadly fair price i think you'll be okay so i would strongly advise writing stuff stuff down right so navin so you had some more questions so just in case quickly want to ask one two more questions we can take that thanks um manish uh, if it's possible to explain little bit more on the stage 1 2 and 3 are there any qualitative filters for those stages also if you could uh, give us little bit more detail on how do we go about uh, uh Uh, segregating into those buckets that will be helpful um uh, yeah so um so you know think about it as uh you know different stages of uh think about it at different stages of how you know when you meet different people around you where would you stack them on uh what is the depth at which they think uh, you know how would you classify you think of any sector you know let's think of a sector which uh, all of us uh, uh, see every day think of a bank right and where would you classify an hdfc bank uh, vis-a-vis an axis bank vis-a-vis uh, a, a mid tier bank vis-a-vis a public sector bank right so you would see uh, all of them just at various levels of maturity of their Uh, approach towards risk towards the dynamism they are exhibiting in the marketplace the cost of their deposits right so it's it's really a, a a tool we use to be honest that you know one can get very excited so there is a stock we own and the p of that company is 4 right but very clearly it's a phase 1 company right so i can't let my excitement around the valuation of the company or uh, or uh, take over the risk management and the fact that there is actually a reason why that company is at a multiple of 4 right there is a certain risk in that which causes the company to be where it is so by forcing yourself to grade a company in a certain way you are just managing risk and outcomes better now we classify phase 1 as a company that is very very cheap uh, the market might be misreading uh uh the promoters governance uh but clearly you know it's not a great company which is why it's phase 1 uh phase 1 company could be a company which you know just gets a big break from some customer you know some customer says i like this guy i'm going to give him a chance right phase 2 would be a company where a customer gives a guy a chance but now you see the customer has been working with this company for over 3 years 4 years 5 years so clearly if a, a, a blue chip customer has been working with you for 5 years you're doing something right right so that would perhaps be a phase 2 company but you know do you see the promoter uh 
evolving to a phase two company in the sense that uh, uh, the uh, the customer has stayed with this guy for a while, but are you expanding in capacity, uh, or are you too content with just what one a promoter is giving you? Right. So I'm saying you 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 divide you architect your own rules with how you will uh, put a company in different buckets. For us, it's four. You know, for you it could be five, it could be three, whatever works. So yeah, I mean, I don't know whether that answers your question. A lot of good pointers, and basically, it's down to risk reward play. Uh, well put, Manish. My final question for the day would be: since uh, you are a bottom-up stock picker and uh, pay uh, little attention to macros, how do you structure your day? What do you look up on on a daily basis? Uh, how do you manage the news flow? Some insights would also be helpful for full-time investors who are aspiring to be great stock pickers like you. well you know firstly i don't fancy myself as a stock picker right i mean uh, if we want low churn in your portfolio you know you can't be picking new stocks right so essentially you're just riding your existing companies you know we i would like myself i, I like to think of myself as a trusted advisor to families we work with rather than a stock picker you know i want uh, i i want to work with people who have reasonable return expectations you know long term compounding about 15 to 18 uh, you know we are not a small cap shop we are not a micro cap shop right a large portion of our portfolio will be boring companies that are well discovered right which just provides stability to the portfolio and about half of our portfolio is what would be you know companies that perhaps you could classify as stock pickers but you know to your point about how i structure our day uh you know news flow is not something that uh, would worry us uh you know even adverse news flow because uh you know our intent is to slow down actually as much as possible you want to slow down decision making so most of the day is actually spent now it's result season you know we are a team of uh, five people so we map companies to different people and uh, you know we follow results and you follow results more because you're trying to understand whether a company is evolving along the framework that we just discussed you know how is a company progressing uh, how is the management thinking so uh, and whoever tracks the result will then go back and put together a short note on you know whether the company is still where it is uh, what uh, we th- we feel whether we should be thinking about a larger position so uh, most of my day would be there are certain uh, uh, companies that i would be keenly tracking so i would not be spending time See on larger companies, but on the smaller companies, I would spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of time reading, so I read for at least four or five hours a day. Uh, you know, uh, it's just you know, our business is all about pattern recognition. Uh, unfortunately, I think the Indian media is uh, does not cover what's happening internationally as well as it should. So I spend a lot of time reading international stuff. uh i spend i try and speak to a lot of people in the industry to help me make sense of what's going on i think uh the a uh, lot of our analyst community we are excessively mathematical uh you know i answered a question earlier about how i think roe and cash flow can be very misleading in the short term but you want to understand from people in the industry about what is happening uh in this industry and and inflection points so uh yeah and uh, you know we uh, we have uh, work from home uh, in our office so we get together uh, twice a week uh, and five days a week people who can work from or three days a week people can work from wherever they want to work so uh, in those two days it's really a lot of extensive uh, discussion about uh, companies that one is uh, encountered with yeah so that's the day really right it's re- it's reading a lot it's talking to people just talking to people in the team whether they've come up with stuff but one thing that we really don't invest time on is trying to track news flow because uh, you know we will not act out of panic if uh, even an adv- an adverse news item comes because anything we hold you know in our uh, if you leave aside our special situations bucket 90% of the portfolio that we have is companies that if the price is down 15 or 20% it should actually excite us that do we want to buy something because you know uh, a company is uh, even if there's adverse news flow and the stock is down 15% unless it's because of governance issues you know 
which we've never had in our portfolio in nine years. It would not be something, a trigger for us to act. So I just encourage our team just to read a lot and, uh, you know, talk to other analysts, talk to other fund managers, talk to people in the industry to figure out uh, what's going on. And uh, we also re keep researching new companies. So as a firm, uh, we would perhaps go through two or three new companies every month. Yeah, so that's about it. Great stuff. Thanks, Manish. Thanks, Naveen. Uh, Kaushik, yes, sir, you can uh, quickly... I have one last question from myself. Uh, I just wanted to understand, uh, basically, doing the bottom-up research, uh, uh, it takes a lot of uh, time and analysis. So, don't you see the terminal value for the business or the industry, what the size is the industry? And uh, would you go on that industry as a bet? Or would you like to play with the uh, king of the industry as the market leader and then go on uh, to on them so uh, you know voice was not very clear but uh, did you could could you repeat your question because there was something there about terminal value and there was something about king about yes. the king of the yes. industry. So, can I, you repeat I, your I, question I, again i think i'm audible right now sir yes yes Sir, I, my basic my question is on uh, you uh, doing bottom up research is more important. I understand, but uh, while doing the bottom up research, uh, industry also plays a major role, and that that actually gives a terminal value for the company. So, would you bet on the terminal value by seeing the opportunity of by doing the bottom up research? You found a terminal value to be very big and the industry to be very big. So that time you would go for the still the company that you have chosen or the market leader or the king of the company. Okay, uh, I understand. So um, see, our bias always is to buy the leader, right? If you if you look at patterns around you, you will see in almost every industry the leaders are taking more and more market share. Uh, leaders are consolidating the industry. So our bias always is to buy the leader. Uh, you know, you would look at a laggard player, uh, you know, a laggard player that is trading very, very cheap. Never say never, but high probability the laggard could actually be a value trap, right? However, I think this approach of buying the leader works well in industries where you see a clear consolidation at play. For example, banking, right? But if you were to look at sectors like manufacturing, now you could call manufacturing one industry, but within manufacturing, you actually have various sub-segments. Uh, so we are participating in technical textiles. We are participating in specialty chemical. We are participating in auto components. So within that, you would, uh, I, I like to look for people who are dominating niches. So again, you're buying not the industry leader, but you're buying somebody who dominates a niche. Now, to your point on terminal value, you know, valuation is the last part of our investment process. And uh, to be honest, you know, in the entire time it takes for us when we research a company, valuation would get less than 10% because we follow very simple thumb rules for valuation, basis where the company is, growth life cycle, what's the width of the moat, what kind of ROE the business is, what kind of growth rates do we think we can forecast, and then we'll put it in a certain uh, uh, bucket. You know, uh, you, we're not going to be torturing an Excel spreadsheet too much there. So the terminal value assumption actually comes in the multiple you're willing to pay. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think this is where people get most of the stuff wrong. I mean, industries are kind of right now, there's so much of technological trends at play. How do you assign a value of a company, you know, 20 years out? So if a lot of our valuation is actually being justified by very high terminal value, I think we are acting basis FOMO. So the, a lot more time will be spent on qualitative analysis. And uh, for most companies, I think, you know, anything above 30, we start uh, a trailing multiple of 30 times earnings, we will start getting a bit uncomfortable. You know, 35 times is a real red line. You know, you might make one or two exceptions, but, you know, more than 35 times is not something that we would... We, we are actually very comfortable. Thanks, sir. And so, so that answered my question. So, Manish, sir, one last question for the day, and that would be around, like, uh, what good books or texts 
uh, which you recommend to our attendees could be a, uh, I mean, uh, which could be beneficial for them in their investment journey? You know, so I think somebody asked the question earlier. I think Prince, you asked the question that there is so much of material out there. You know, I really think you don't need to spend just to build your own investment framework. You know, just print out everything Anand Sridharan of Nalanda Capital has written. You know, all of it will be in LinkedIn. Just print it out, put it in a binder and just go through that over and over again. You don't need to read too many investment books, right? If, you know, I think read, you don't need to read too many books on technical stuff or DCF. You know, read financial history. I think this is really a game about control of behavior. I think it's a game of understanding yourself and crafting an investment approach that is basis how you understand yourself. I think Anand Sridharan of Nalanda does a fantastic job on that because he explains Nalanda's approach and how uh, you know Nalanda's approach is really suited to their personality and their customer base. And you don't have to ape what Nalanda is doing, but if you understand what the guy is laying out, you can take elements of that and figure out what should be your approach, right? So one is that. Uh, the second uh, stuff I would read is just read about financial history because it tells you that, uh, you know, it tells you about the nature of markets. And the fact is that when the best opportunities come, everyone freezes. So how do you maintain uh, the discipline and the fortitude to go in when the chips are down? And third is I'm saying just read anything that interests you, you know, uh, you know, typically when I read, I'll spend a couple of hours a day, but, you know, uh, I, I'll start with the Financial Times and the links I click, I click there, they just lead me all over the world, right, wherever someone has read something. And I think the, the, the trick uh, that works for me in being able to expand my reading is to quickly ditch something that is not of interest. If something's that just not of interest, you don't have to spend time reading it just because you opened it. So read as extensively as you can, uh, read as, uh, you know, on different topics. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really our business is all about pattern recognition and being able to make connections between things you've read. They need not be about the investment world. Uh, I would strongly recommend the Financial Times. I would strongly recommend the Economist magazine because, you know, they're writing about stuff that we don't get to read in India about what's happening globally but which will create a lot of opportunity for manufacturing out of India. So, yeah, I don't know whether that answers your question. It surely does, sir. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much for taking out uh, time for this session, sir. It was really insightful, and I hope I did justice to your time. Uh, it was really wonderful uh, questions from the attendees as well. So, so any any closing remarks, sir, before we close for the day? No, thanks for having me, Prince, and uh, happy investing, everyone. Uh, and if any of you write uh, uh, any blogs or something, you know, I'd be happy to be put on your mailing list. So, uh, you know, uh, and if stuff is there that tickles us, uh, you know, uh, we'd be happy to get your feedback on our investment notes about things you agree with, disagree with, happy to learn from you. So uh, thanks for the opportunity, Prince. I enjoyed this. Uh, uh, Thank you much, sir. Yeah. Good night. Take care, sir. And uh, for our attendees who joined late, the session is recorded and I'll be uploading it over YouTube shortly. So please feel free to revisit whenever you get time. And also, like uh, prior to this, uh, there are two, three more interactions of Manish, sir, and you will find great uh, insights and humility in those videos as well. So please have a look at those. So thank you, sir. Thank you once again. Good night. Take care. Yeah.